ask the applicant to approach the podium. Mr. Darrell, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President, members of the Council. It's a pleasure to be here again. I did want to open up um, just by thanking the Council, uh, thanking the members of the community, all the staff, and of course, uh, including planning staff and planning board. It's been a long journey, um, a lot of work, a lot of collaboration um, with planning staff, with the public hearings, um, with the professionals in the community, with the planning board. Um, as you know, we just are here before you, coming from the uh, planning board who is statutorily charged with providing you with an opinion um, as to whether or not they felt, they felt that our proposal uh, was consistent with your comprehensive plan. Um, having received favorable comments, um, sorry, favorable recommendation from your planning staff and the planning board, that's what brings us here before you. Um, I won't repeat the summary, but as you know, this is in respect to a new subdistrict of the Waterfront Special Development District that is proposed to be called Metacomet. Um, I want to go over a couple of highlights. Maybe we could put our, our presentation up, that'd be great. Um, also, uh, Council President, to help with the brevity of our presentation and our repeat things, would we at this time be able to ask the Council to admit the Planning Board record, the Planning Board recommendations, the staff recommendations, and the report that was issued by our planner, uh, Samson and Weston, I was reverse it, Weston and Samson, Samson and Weston, sorry, Weston and Samson, to the record. Yes. I only have a I have one question about this that was just passed out prior to council meeting. I never had a chance to see this or read this prior to this meeting. So to, uh, to have this entered into record right now is a little bit unfair for people like myself who haven't had a chance to read it. Council President, if I can just um, please, uh, Council Monroe, that's just a continuation of the record from the planning board that was submitted for the planning board. We're just providing it to you as an additional copy. So that would have been submitted and available for public viewing probably about three or four weeks ago. Okay, I'm just making it known for the record that I wasn't aware of that, so. And it's consistent with the, it was, it was a supplement to the testimony provided live at the hearing and then reflected in the decision by the planning board uh, provided to you all. Okay. So I move to accept those documents into the record. Do you have a second on that? No, I'll second. Madam okay. Clerk, roll call, call please. Councilwoman Souza. Aye. Councilman Cahoon. Aye. Councilman Rahner. Aye. Council Vice President Rodericks. Aye. Council President Brennan. Aye. Please proceed. Thank you. Um, and again, that's mostly for brevity, so I'll do a things. Uh, tonight's presentation is going to be, we're going to try to uh, keep it pretty brief. I know lots of folks want, uh, want to be heard. Um, one, if you could please put it to the next slide, just a brief summary just to remind uh, folks. Um, as required, as your city solicitor could also advise, um, all the advertisements follow our original petition. However, we have worked with your planning staff, with your planning board, and as you saw from the planning decision, there is a series of conditions. Um, when I walk through where we are today, uh, you will note that we, will, we have incorporated the conditions that have come from the exercises with your the required exercises, with your planning staff, with your planning board, and is reflected in their uh, recommendation, the recommended conditions. Um, so just as a reminder, as you saw before, when we came before this council for the substantial change determination, as presented to the planning board, uh, this is the subject parcel. Before you, um, were this to be approved, there'd be the area labeled A and the area labeled C would be submitted to this district. The area labeled A would be limited to the uses set forth in the proposed zoning table as supplemented by the conditions that I just referred to and presented by your solicitor in all the materials. I believe you called it a denome, Mr. Solicitor? I forgot what you titled it. Give me two seconds. Sub A. Sub A, thank you. Sub A, apologize. Um, and uh, C, area C, would be maintained, and I want to be super clear, because we're super clear with planning, or we're super clear with council, would be a golf course out of the gate constructed, and if it should ever cease to be used as a nine-hole golf course, it would be green space, publicly available green space. You'll see that condition is written up clearly in the condition that came from the planning board. That would be evidenced by any decision this council might make, the corresponding ordinance, 
and a deed restriction to be recorded in the East Providence land evidence records. Neither of those steps that would codify those realities can be altered by the Waterfront Commission should this be before the Waterfront Commission. The solicitor spoke very clearly on that at the planning board, and that actually is the statute and the law. Um, but just making it clear, C would be restricted to a golf course, a publicly available green space, deed restricted. Um, continuing, one of the conditions that your solicitor put on in the review process, and we'll talk more about this later, uh, all of these areas would be subject to a Rhode Island Class 1 survey to be submitted, so there would be no debates as to the lines, as to where any of these lines that we're talking about, A, B, C, or other lines are located. We, uh, development, sorry, rephrase, applicant would be required in the first phase of development to um, construct and make available for public use that golf course. Um, just want to continue, uh, we, uh, sorry, to finish the slide. Uh, additionally, uh, parcel B would be the proposed parcel that we intend to make, uh, to grant to the city by way of D. Um, city could obviously use it however it's so, so fit. Um, we propose uses in our prior presentations, um, but I won't uh, belabor the point by going through them. Uh, next slide, please. So we talked about the A and C um, being in the district. We, taught, we talked about how um, the uses for A is a set forth, also subject to the multiple conditions, which were reviewed just once at the end, um, and how we would treat the open space. Uh, and then they gifted nine plus or minus acres to the city of Providence. Next slide, please. East Providence. Uh, East Providence, sorry. I'm speaking fast and uh, going my water with me. Thanks. Um, we'll come back to one just so you can see the map. Um, but we have a, sup a supplemental map that was produced at the planning board that just shows out more clearly some of these areas. Um, so I'm going to skip back to one, two, and three, which is just a reiteration we just talked about. Condition four was put on by um, your solicitor as requiring a class one survey so that all these boundaries could be uh, codified with due accuracy. We obviously agreed to that. We, you've heard us previously present uh, condition number five that um, we would provide reduced green fees for obviously residents of East Providence as well as a complimentary utilization of the course by the East Providence High School golf team. Next slide, please. Um, again, I made this point in the opening because I understood there were some concerns, but that's how we would obviously treat Area C. We call it golf or green. It would be a public golf course or public green space, condition to the zoning ordinance and deep restricted. Um, we would also, which you've heard since the beginning, integrate an extensive network of uh, walking paths throughout the development with emphasis provided on connectivity to Pierce Fields and access to get across the park or to the bike path. Um, we also agreed in prior conditions that we would use reasonable efforts along the property to be conveyed to the city to maintain mature trees along that to just further enhance what before we talk about a ladder condition, it's already approximately a 300 feet minimal buffer. That actually will increase as we'll talk about a couple of conditions. No new curb cuts permitted along Fort Street west of Bentley, something that came up in extensive communication with the, with the neighbors in the community, early uh, agreed upon by um, marshals and obviously would be continued. Um, also it was very important and was agreed to as a condition during the planning board process, the affordable housing component that some uh, have raised questions about an ability to pay in lieu. We would give up that right. Uh, this, the chapter and verse is cited in the notes, but um, in short, the affordable housing, inclusionary housing would be on site. The 10% would be provided, built on site. Next slide, please. Um, so on fourth, uh, 11, just give us one second, we'll bounce back to that because that is better described with the map that follows the sheet. Um, but in short, 11 refers to the planning board's comments that they wanted to provide some additional buffering for certain structures. So we provided an additional 50 foot no build zone off of uh, what is approximately 300 feet, which you'll see on the plans again, very familiar to you, but we'll show you at the end, as well as a certain area that the height restriction, although requested as five stories, would be limited to four um, in that area after 
the extensive buffer. Um, following uses and items addressed throughout the use table, several of these were in the original, several were enhanced through the planning board and planning staff process and included in the planning board's decision. Um, and obviously the residential development be included as part of a mixed use development that any furniture and home furnishings and appliance uh, storage be limited to a building for a print of 25,000. Uh, the developer agreed to a smaller general merchandise footprint of 25,000. We had originally asked for 30. Um, that um, it would uh, that the Medicom and Subject uh, Grocery Store, just to be inclusionary language, supermarket printing and publishing shall be limited to consumer retail. There was a concern raised that we might try to do a printing operation on site, so we clarified that. Um, Package stores uh, or liquor stores would be limited to retail sales area 7,500. It came up in the planning process. There was fear that there'd be a large, like the warehouse, like side, side of highway kind of, you see upstate New Hampshire, uh, so we agreed to that. The fast food limitation building size was agreed to in prior. Um, that's, uh, you'll also note subject to conditional approvals. Um, next slide, please. Um, continuing. There was concern that there would be a large conference center without appropriate consideration, so that was made a conditional use over 25,000 feet. They did not want dog kennels on the site, so we agreed that unless it was relevant to, or sorry, related to a veterinary care, that there would be no dog kennels uh, operations. Um, drop off, pick up, dry cleaning only, meaning they did not want a dry cleaning processing plant on site, because that adds a new component of contaminants to be concerned with, so that was agreed to. Pharmacy restriction, health and fitness restriction, um, all with size footprints, and if the fitness center were to go larger than 15,000 feet, it would be a conditional use requiring that additional approval. I believe your solicitor walked you through it the last time we were here, but a conditional approval uh, under a waterfront condition district is a pretty extensive permit with, sorry, process with even additional standards than uh, is required in the city's process for special use permits. Um, sale of business and industrial equipment requiring outdoor storage and staging was prohibited. However, the planning board did want to make sure that they did not exclude outdoor garden centers and smaller hardware stores, so that's when they came up with the 25,000 square foot use and um, complementary outdoor uh, uses such as garden centers. Um, and then uh, it was asked to clarify that they don't want self-storage on the site, but were you to have a condominium building or something, and there was storage within a lower level or something, that that's not what was meant by no self-storage. If we could have the next slide. So this is just demonstrative of the points that I mentioned earlier. This came out of work with the planning staff and the planning board. You'll see that hash line that's labeled 50-foot building setback. That's just an additional buffer to top off um, where there would be no development. So in addition to the 240, 260, 250, and then as you turn the corner, uh, down what we used to refer before the council as the knuckle. That buffer area is now enhanced by an additional 50-foot building setback, and we agreed to the mature tree preservation on that line. That Thank you, by the way, for tracking that line. That's the line of mature tree preservation as well. Um, and then the yellow area is the additional restricted area that would be limited to four, as opposed to uh, the five originally requested on, on the balance. So. That's a summary kind of catching everybody up from the original uh, petition to the revised plan that was presented on the substantial change to what's happened through the required process of the planning board, sorry, the planning staff and the planning board. Um, again, keeping this moving, um, as I'm sure your solicitor has advised or will advise, there are a requirement uh, for certain findings that need to be made as accepted to the record. Uh, they were referred to in planning staff report, they were referred to in the planning board approval and in the record from the planning board was accepted, including the testimony um, from Ms. Sweet. So we've just asked her to present a summary of certain select findings just so the council has the opportunity to hear it in person and maybe generate any follow-up questions you might have. So if the council president please would like to turn over to Ms. Sweet for a quick moment. Please do. Thank you. Ms. Sweet, can you just uh, state your name? Ashley Sweet. For the record, and what is it that you're doing with your occupation? Uh, I'm a professional planner. Okay. Uh, Council President, it, it was done at planning, but I just figured um, I would like to submit Ms. Sweet to be accepted as an expert to the Council as well as she was with planning. And we have our information in her uh, uh, resume on file. 
Yeah, okay. including planning and again copies for courtesy. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, we'll make a motion. Though. Thank you, sir. Oh, no. Okay. Does anyone like to make sure, a motion? Sure. Move the expert witness. Okay. Anyone like to second that motion? Uh, roll call vote, please. Councilman Susan. Aye. Councilman Cahoon. Aye. Councilman Morano. Aye. Councilman Vice President Rogers. Aye. Councilman Zephyr. Aye. Please proceed. Thank you. Good evening, members of the council. Um, I'm here tonight to provide you with a brief summary of the report that was presented to the planning board during their uh, consideration of the advisory opinion on this zone change and comprehensive plan amendment. So if you could move to the next slide, please. I will attempt to keep this brief. Everything that I'm going to go over for you is presented in great detail um, in the report that was presented to the planning board and then now presented to the council um, as part of the record. There is a requirement in your zoning ordinance, as well as in Rhode Island general law, that any amendment to a zoning ordinance or a zoning map must be found to be consistent with the purposes of zoning. Um, in the East Providence zoning ordinance, there is a list of 16 purposes which are mirrored in state law. Um, instead of going through all 16 of those, I have kind of grouped them into some categories for brevity uh, sake. They are outlined in the report. All 16 of them are, are presented and um, provided commentary on each of those 16. But for the purposes of this hearing, I've grouped them into six categories, and I'd like to just briefly share those with you. Um, number one, purposes of zoning talk about the appropriate, safe, environmentally sensitive, innovative, and balanced development is called for in the city. Um, we believe that this, app, this future application for development would be subject to review by the appropriate reviewing authority where there are high standards that have to be met by any development that are designed to ensure that development is appropriate, safe, environmentally sensitive, that it is innovative and it is balanced for the community. So we believe that that's a standard, those standards that address those issues would be met through the review process. Um, number, the, number two would be that development benefits the general public and local residents as well as balances the financial and scenic quality of the community. Again, this would be an application that would go through a rigorous approval process once a development is proposed and all of the standards that are in place in your existing ordinances and, and requirements are going to address all of those issues. There are required findings that have to be made that touch upon each of those. Uh, number three would be to provide a balance of housing options, including affordable units, economic opportunity, and protection of the public investment. The applicant has agreed um, in the ordinance that's being proposed that there would be a balance of housing types, a balance of commercial and economic opportunities, anything from retail to office space, as well as improvements to public infrastructure that would be required as part of the review process before the review authority. Number four would be to provide for a range of uses and intensities that are consistent and appropriate with the character of the city, reflecting current and future needs. This again would be, uh, there's a schedule of uses that are contained in your ordinance already. The proposed amendments are consistent with those schedule of uses. There are no uses that are currently proposed in this new district that are out of character or out of keeping with the existing uses that are allowed in your waterfront districts. Number five would be that the amendment can, retains consistency with the remainder of the zoning ordinance. This is to ensure that uh, as sections of the zoning or ordinance or map are amended over time, that there are no internal inconsistencies created by those amendments. And the change to the zoning ordinance that's being proposed um, will not threaten or the integrity of your existing ordinance. It, it takes the existing waterfront district and expands upon it uh, by adding a section of land, but it doesn't propose anything that's out of keeping with what's already allowed in your waterfront districts. And number six, and maybe most importantly, is consistency with the comprehensive plan. Um, this. I'd like to go into this a little bit more detail because it is probably one of the most important pieces um, of approving an amendment to the zoning ordinance or to the comprehensive plan. And something unique about East Providence's comprehensive plan is that you actually have 
for findings of fact in your land use element that are required to be made in order for an amendment to be approvable um, in the comprehensive plan. And that's something, I've looked at a lot of comprehensive plans and that's something I've not seen before, so that's a unique and, and in my opinion, a, a, a very good mechanism by which the body that's making these changes or approving these changes is required to hold these changes to a higher standard than is typically done in other communities. So if I could just briefly go over those four standards with you. The first is being a development pattern that's contained in the land use plan inadequately provides the appropriate optional sites for the use proposed in the amendment. So there are other areas of the city certainly that would allow similar types of uses but this area is pretty is well suited and should not be considered necessarily as competition with those other areas. This site presents a unique opportunity to combine recreation, open space, retail, and housing within a fairly compact area um, that's well served by, by transportation options. Number two would be the amendment constitutes an overall improvement to the comprehensive plan and is not solely for the good or benefit of a particular landowner or <coughs> owners at a particular point in time. The proposed amendment, and you could see from the report, um, there's an extensive list of goals, policies, and action items that are made as statements in your comprehensive plan. And it's the responsibility of the city and, and the various staff and departments to implement those goals, policies, and actions. And in our opinion, this amendment actually does implement a lot of those goals, policies, and actions. And I'd like to, when we finish going through these four, to quickly read to you a summary of some of those goals, policies, and actions. Number three is that the amendment will not adversely impact the community as a whole or a portion of the community by significantly altering acceptable land use patterns, requiring larger and more expensive improvements to road, sewer, or water systems that are needed to support the prevailing land uses and which therefore may impact development of other lands, adversely impacting land uses because of increased traffic on existing systems or affect the livability of the area or the health and safety of the residents. This is a, a balanced, App, uh, uh, application to amend your comprehensive plan and zoning ordinance. It takes a large piece of property and it dedicates some of it to continued recreation and green space. It takes a portion of it and provides open space to the city and it takes a portion of it and provides economic development and housing options for the city. Um, and again, it's going to go through a very stringent review process before the reviewing authority on already established standards that it will be required to meet. And number four is that the amendment is consistent with the overall intent of the comprehensive plan. And again, I'd like to just read you a quick list. These are excerpts of language that come from your comprehensive plan. So the, the, the language that I'll read was taken out of sections of your comprehensive plan, whether it be la language in the uh, excuse me, language in the text of the document, a goal or a policy or a specific action item. So the plan speaks to diversifying the tax base, maintaining and enhancing city parks and open space, encouraging redevelopment of parcels, encouraging a mix of land uses, rezoning parcels where appropriate to provide opportunities for development, permit infill and redevelopment, require the dedication of open space and recreation as part of redevelopment proposals, revise the zoning ordinance as necessary to promote flexibility in development, work with private landowners to meet goals and objectives of the comprehensive plan, foster a positive business environment, modify city regulations to encourage development of underutilized parcels, provide an increased diversity of recreational opportunities, encourage private recreational facilities to open to residents at minimal charge, expand recreation network through the donation of easements or land, provide a mix of activity, both recreational and functional, provide pedestrian path systems, and preserve natural areas for passive recreation and reflection. And you'll see in the report again, that we go into great detail on how we believe this application fulfills all of those 
requirements of your comprehensive plan and more. And I am certainly available for any questions that you might have. Pleasure of the council, do you have any questions for Ms. Sweet? If not, I have one question. Yes. Can this, all that you mentioned, still be accomplished without having to go to the waterfront or be redistrict as waterfront? Can the city still accomplish all that you mentioned without that designation of waterfront? So the, the, my understanding of your waterfront district is that the, it is a component of your zoning ordinance. It, it's, you're not required to zone parcels in the waterfront district for development purposes. This parcel is adjacent to the waterfront district. Um, and it probably, it logically makes sense to be an extension of the waterfront district. Um, and the city still accomplished the same goals. The city can create. Without having to have it rezoned as waterfront. No. The, the city can. Who, who's saying no? Excuse me. Who's saying no? I am. This is, this is, oh, hold your voice please. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Councilman Riley, would you permit me just to phrase the question that's relevant to her expertise sure. and then I can answer the legal side because it's a two-part question. So, Ms. Sweet, what, what I believe Councilman Riley is trying to get to at least from your expertise is you reference a series of goals and do you see achieving some or all of those goals tied into what the tools that you find in the waterfront district or do you see them standing alone in the zoning ordinance without those additional tools? From a planning perspective. From a planning perspective, the goals, policies, and actions and that, that language that I spoke to that's in your plan is not specified on how it's accomplished. It doesn't have to be a waterfront district. It can be, an, you have the power to zone as you see appropriate. So if you were to create a different zone um, and apply it to a parcel, you could accomplish the same goals and by you, doing that. When you reference the comprehensive plan, when you say, okay, for example, achieving these elements that the suite laid out you mentioned in there the process that is being submitted to would support reaching these goals yes your opinion was based on the process set forth in the waterfront commission though because you read the architectural review you read the affordable housing Correct. the things that so what council morado is saying is were your opinions based on utilizing the tools that are set forth in the toolbox for the waterfront commission which we just that's answered, that's yeah. just an avenue that you want to take. Well, no. What, that, what I'm asking is, can we as a city still, if we didn't have the waterfront commission, if, if it never, sure. never existed, can we still accomplish the things that were? And, and the reason I said that it's a legal question, not a planning question, and the answer is no. You can't because she cited multiple utilization of tools that are only found in the waterfront commission regulations, and I can start to cite them if you'd like that are not in your existing. Now, it's a bit of a loaded question because could you, what she's saying is, could you create a new zoning district and start loading it up all those things? Yes, you can. But the testimony she gave today pulls from tools that are only in your waterfront district, and I'm answering that as a lawyer on the record, not in your current zoning ordinance without that overlay, correct? Correct, your waterfront district has a higher standard for development than your, than your zoning ordinances that apply to other areas of town. And when I say higher standard, it's a, I'm talking about architectural review, aesthetic review, you know, traffic review, all of those are kind of elevated as, as a higher standard. Yeah, Council Moore, I was, just, I was just bifurcating because if you ask a planner who, by the way, writes zoning ordinances and codes, can you? Sure, you, you could achieve whatever you want, but not in the current what you have. And then the other great benefit to go on the waterfront is the TIF, the TIFs, correct? If you that's a question, I'm happy to address it. Correct. Okay, um, actually, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, first off, first and foremost, the enabling legislation that the General Assembly used to establish the Waterfront District Commission, it does a, it, it sets forth its goals and it sets forth its priorities, but there's a few that relate to your question, right? One, you need more tools to develop large and complex product projects set forth in the enabling legislation. These are the types of projects of this size and scale that occur over longer periods of time that the General Assembly did not find the local ordinances had the accoutrements, the tools, and whatnot to handle. Additionally, these are projects that typically involve significant state, city, 
and private stakeholder, and that's the language they use. Private sector, sorry, private sector. And this is a tool to bring all three together, not just one, not just two, all three. Included in that is the availability to seek a TIF. But I'm glad Council Ronnie brought that up because a misnomer that's been talked about a lot, and I'm just going to address it in my closing, so I'll address it now. Any understanding that we can modify the TIF plan for the Waterfront District without this council is wrong. This council must approve any modification of the TIF plan. TIF plan it doesn't matter if the commission says we love it, give them the sun. It doesn't matter if I tell you I'm going to build you a, a, a overpass. The, it comes right here. So we, if and when that ever occurs, we look forward to your opinion and we would beg of you a decision, but can't happen without you. I, I, I understand that. I'm not on a journey, but I'm very well, yes. well aware that we're the ones that approve that. Mm -hmm. But I also know that down the road, the examples used by other waterfront districts, you guys are going to be seeking the same treatment as far as those stiff incentives. And when we start talking about early on about how much uh, tax that this project is going to increase, you know, we had numbers of eight to ten million. You're in, it's already an opportunity zone. In ten years, you don't have to pay anything in taxes. Oh my God, why not? No, that's not correct. I mean, but it is an opportunity zone. You do have some tax incentives because of that. You're, you're, you're mixing real estate taxes, which are relevant to a tech, and, and then you tip, then, then down the road you'll ask for then down the road you'll ask for a tip. So when does the city start to see? Well, what I'd like to do, Councilor, is ask you not to continue to perpetrate the misunderstanding. You can't talk about federal tax status of an investment property and a real estate tax tool for financing, particularly infrastructure. Let's let's not keep confusing people. So what you're talking about, your first question is, is infrastructure. Who knows if the city and the state and the commission start looking for infrastructure, we may look to the city council, to the waterfront commission to say, how should we fund it? Should we use tax dollars generated from this? Should we fund it with cash? And none of that's a given. But back to the enabling legislation, it's a tool in the toolbox. Perfect example. You want to talk about traffic. You want to talk about um, uh, architecture review. And the Waterfront Commission, as our expert testified, it's elevated. Not only do we have to present, not only these subcommittees, we have to pay for an additional peer expert. So these are all things that come into play that I can't sit here and tell you what's going to happen, but I can tell you there's a lot of safeguards that don't exist in any other ordinance that this city is, at, is, is subject to. Um, should I continue with my closing? Or? Thank you, Council Morado. Appreciate your time. Um, so, you know, just in closing, you know, and I'm, I'm glad that that came up more organically. A, a lot of this came through, not a lot of this, almost everything you see here came through an extensive process. Whether it be a year and a half ago, the marshals walking through the neighborhood, whether it be all of us on the team fielding emails, fielding calls, fielding texts, fielding whatever we, you know, came our way, literally begging in public forums. Please give us feedback. I believe Leah Marshall must have been heard dozens of times saying, we're listening. I think it was a marketing campaign. And, and it was interesting because at the planning board, uh, I give a lot of credit uh, you know, to that process. And it was raised at one point, you know, oh, all this, all this stuff last minute and all these changes. And, and in fact, the comment that it was raised about had, had been out there for over a year. We've asked everybody to sit down, every single one of the stakeholders. We've asked everybody to come to our table, bring your experts, bring anybody you have. And we believe we've done one of the most difficult jobs as a private sector, but heck, extraordinarily more difficult for you as decision makers in the public eye of balancing the interests. Balancing the interests at an early stage, which is even more difficult. None of us have a crystal ball. None of us can, we'd love to say, hey, where is any process going to end? Then I'll give you my decision at the beginning. But we don't have that luxury. And I don't envy the position that the council's in. I don't envy any elected official in a process when we're at a beginning stage, but these processes were laid out. As a developer, we didn't establish them. We're just following the rules that were laid out, the processes that were given to us. And we sit here before you with the planning staff that was charged to give recommendations and opinions supporting all the findings of our expert the planning department sorry the planning board charged statutorily with giving you their findings in an advisory opinion you can read the lengthy decision and the staff report from your staff 
all support the same findings that Ms. Sweet uh, put in there. And, it, and it's funny, one of the main goals that I think our supporters really pick up on and they love and get sometimes turned a different, into a different light or through a different lens by those who may not be in support is the preservation aspect is about public recreation space, public open space. Ashley walked through, Ms. Sweet, sorry, Ashley, Ms. Sweet walked through a lot of those, those goals to say, hey, everybody, listen, you didn't have these 48 acres available. Nobody has to give them. You know, we all talked about the buy right development, which your solicitor went through the last time in great detail. This is the chance in a process we didn't write for the council to have a say, for the council to send us back to the drawing board as you did, for the council to send us to work with your staff, with your planning board, to go back to the drawing board and come up with more conditions. When people say, well, you have no say, we'll lose control. If we did the buy right, there's nothing that goes before the city council. If you wrote your own ordinance that does not go to the waterfront district, once you're done with that, it does not go back to the council. This process that we've all been in, working our, 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 you know, to the bone, trying to accommodate as many interests. Some people say, let it grow over. On the other half said, make it golf. I I'm confused. We did our best to balance the interest, but this is the process. These, and, and solicitor, apologize if I'm off the number, but 20 plus conditions are a result of having a say of the city council sending us back to the drawing board, making us work harder. So to not approve the requested rezone actually pivots the other way. There will be, not city council, the planning board and the planning staff, and then there's regulations we abide by. But we appreciate the enhanced standards that we're subjecting ourselves to by requesting uh, being put in the Waterfront Commission, uh, Special District, Metacomet Subdistrict, and all the commission, uh, sorry, all the capitalities effectively would be council conditions that we've worked through. And we appreciate the time. I know everybody has been hearing from all ends. I want you to know that the marshal appreciate your time. Um, we've done our best, and, and I will tell you, as much as it's difficult on you, it was difficult on us too, because every time we thought we made a right decision, we heard from other groups. Um, but we do think that this is the best. We will continue. Um, if we're afforded the opportunity to listen and to apply all comment that we get, whether it be from elected officials or constituents, and to try to make this a gem that you all can be proud of having been a part of, hopefully, and all the community can be proud of as having given us input that we did, in fact, integrate. I do appreciate your time. I know a lot of people want to speak, so I'll, I'll be quiet now. Thank you. Council President, members of the council, thank you. Council President, may I ask one question? Yes, please. Do we know of anyone else who wants to present on the screen? Are there any other presentations on the screen related to this topic or? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you.